1 Corinthians chapter 16. For 15 chapters, Paul has been teaching God's truths and correcting the chaos and error in the Corinthian church. In chapter 16, he gives some practical truths, some practical instruction. After this grand discussion of resurrection in chapter 15, he has been talking about glorified bodies and changing from mortality to immortality in the twinkling of an eye and the sound of a trumpet. And when that which eyes have not seen and ears have not heard and neither has entered into the heart of mankind becomes reality. And we're there and we see it. It's been a glorious chapter. And now we get to chapter 16 and we're back to where we live now. And he gives us some instruction about what we need to be doing in this life. The glimpses we get of the believer's future glory of all that's going to happen to us um, gives us responsibility for the present. We've talked about that. The resurrection not only gives us hope, it gives us purpose for what we're doing here now, and it gives us a reason to work toward being like Jesus. And so uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11, Peter asks a question that always kind of stuns my heart when I read it. He basically says, all right, since you know all of these things are going to happen, and he particularly in that place is talking about the destruction of the earth. And so we've been talking about glory and resurrection and eternal life and what that's going to be like with Jesus. And so he asked this question. He says, since you know all of these things are going to happen, what sort of people ought you be in holy conduct and godliness? What sort of people ought you be in holy conduct and godliness? And that kind of calls us into accountability. So the first practical issue of Christian living that Paul discusses in chapter 16 is giving. And here in verse one, he simply says, now concerning the collection to the saints. Remember that the Corinthians had written Paul a letter with all kinds of questions and first Corinthians is Paul's answering those questions. It's his reply. And so it kind of seems that the offering was probably mentioned in the letter that they had sent to Paul. So immediately we know some things from verse one. He says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the church of Galatia, so do you also. Now down in verse three, we see, and when I arrive, uh, whomever you may approve, I shall send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. So what we know immediately is that the offering, the collection is for the saints in Jerusalem. Now let's talk about that for a few minutes. In this ancient world, extreme poverty was common. It was poverty like we don't really know much about in this country. Jerusalem was a poor city. The city struggled because it was often overpopulated by the special feasts and the celebrations and all those people coming into town. And it suffered also from a famine uh, that had taken place several years earlier than this. And so the plight of the persecuted Christians in Jerusalem made everything even worse. It was serious in Jerusalem, especially serious for Christians. Now remember that Paul was a Jew. And after Paul was called by the Lord Jesus to a missionary to the Gentiles, he went to Jerusalem. There's a record of that in Galatians chapter two. And you will see there that Peter, James, and John kind of commissioned Paul and Barnabas uh, to send them out. And when they did, they said, remember the poor. Remember the poor. And so Paul responded with, I'm eager to do that. So Paul had the poor on his heart. He was well aware of the situation in Jerusalem. Remember that Paul was converted, some say 33, some say 35 AD. Somewhere there, Paul was converted to Christianity. And um, 
after he was converted on the Damascus Road, he went to Arabia for three years. Paul's role was to be a missionary to the Gentiles. That was his assignment from the Lord. Paul was born in Tarsus, a major Roman city, and he was brought up in Jerusalem. So he's got a lot of background. We also know that he was a Pharisee, a Pharisee of the Pharisees and a persecutor of Christians. So he spent a lot of time in Jerusalem. He knew Jerusalem, even though he had been born in Tarsus. And he was on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus to arrest Christians, to arrest followers of Jesus, when Jesus himself met him on the Damascus road. So then after he was converted, after he was confronted by the Lord Jesus, after he was transformed, changed in his spirit, then he went to Arabia for three years. We don't know a lot about that. Scripture doesn't tell us a lot about that. But one thing we know is that in Acts chapter 11, the gospel began expanding to the Gentiles. It's an incredible record to watch. If you just sit down and read the book of Acts, you begin to see how God begins to include Gentiles in the body of Christ. And so <clears throat> the Jews were finally beginning to understand about chapter 11 of the book of Acts that the Gentiles were going to be included in the gospel. So some of them are having trouble grasping that because they thought it was just for them. But the Lord was moving in the church at Jerusalem. And the people in, in, in Jerusalem, in the church that was at uh, Antioch in, in chapter, in, excuse me, in Acts chapter 11, they got word of it in Jerusalem that God was doing great things. And so they sent Barnabas to check it out. They said, Barnabas, you go see what's really going on there. And when he got there, he witnessed the grace of God and they understood that God was including the Gentiles in the gospel. And so Barnabas, being the encourager that he was, remember his name means encourager, son of encourager, he began to encourage them to remain true to the Lord Jesus. And then in Acts chapter 11 and verse 25, he, we find out that he left there then to go to Tarsus to find Paul. So somewhere in all of that three years, Paul knew, Barnabas knew that, Paul, that God had called Paul to be a missionary to the Gentiles. So here he is in this situation where Gentiles are being saved and all of these questions are being asked. And he goes, hmm, I need to go find Paul. So he goes and finds Paul. It's interesting that he went to Tarsus to find Paul because that was Paul's birthplace. So whatever he did in those three years, as he's going around teaching and understanding what the Lord's telling him to do, he went, he was in the area, Barnabas apparently knew it. And so he goes to find Paul or Saul still. Well, Barnabas found him and they went back to Antioch and they stayed there for a year. That's what Acts chapter 11, verse 26 tells us. And they taught the church. So you've got this new growing church in Antioch. You've got these Gentiles being saved. You've got Jews understanding that the Gentiles and Jews are going to be one. They're going to be one body. And so all that tells us, that point of scripture tells us that the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. I think that's a fascinating thing to think about. The word Christians literally means little Christs. And I have read that when they called them Christians, that was some of the unbelievers who were calling them Christians because they were disgusted by it. They didn't like it that they were like Christ. But the good news for us is they, they were acting like Jesus. They had been changed to be like Jesus. And so they were called little Christ. First time, Antioch, Paul and Barnabas, Christians. So during that time, some folks went down from Jerusalem to Antioch and there was a certain prophet there named Agabus. And he proclaimed that there was about to be this worldwide famine. Well, they believed him 
and they apparently were on the edge of that famine. And so the disciples took up an offering in Antioch to send for relief to the Christian brethren living in Jerusalem, living in Judea. So they thought, oh my goodness, watch, watch the heart of believers here. Immediately there's this heart to give. Oh, we've got brothers, we've got brethren, we've got other believers in Jerusalem. They're about to have a worse time than what they're having already. And so they took up an offering uh, and they sent the offering by Barnabas and Saul to Jerusalem. That was around 44 AD. So they delivered the funds to the believers in Jerusalem and then they went back to Antioch. Now, Paul's first missionary journey, you'll remember that he had, we say he had three, some people say he had four, some people want to say he had five. We know about three. And so his first missionary journey begins in Acts chapter 13. That was around 45 AD. So Paul may have been saved now, or see, he's still Saul, I forget that. He may have been saved now for around 10 years, something like that. And so he begins his first missionary journey uh, in Acts chapter 13. And in that first journey, he went about establishing churches. He's traveling about establishing churches. And so then when we get to Acts chapters 15 through 18, that would have been around 49 to 52 AD, we have the record of his second missionary journey. Now understand uh, Paul was saved, if he was saved around 33 to 35 AD, these people are still very close uh, in memory to the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. These people had heard about it. They were there. They were living. And so we're just now getting to around 49 to 52 AD, and he starts this second journey. In his second journey, he intended to build up the churches that he had established on the first journey. Uh, the Holy Spirit, though, instead led him to go to Greece. You will remember the story. This is in Acts chapter 15 and verse 36, if you want to study it later. Uh, it was then that Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia standing and appealing to him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. So instead of just going around ministering to the churches he had established, the Lord expanded his borders. And so he went to Greece. He went to Macedonia and Philippi, Thessalonica, Athens, and he went to Corinth. And then he went back to Ephesus and then back to Antioch. Well, after a short time, he began his third missionary journey. This is in Acts chapter 18 and verse 23 through uh, chapter 21 and verse 17. And this time he did get a chance to touch back with some of the churches that he had established earlier on the first two missionary journeys. Scripture tells us, though, that during this third journey, sometime around this time, he stayed in Ephesus about three years. Well, it was while he was in Ephesus that he wrote 1 Corinthians. Remember, he had been to Corinth on the second journey. And so now he is in his third journey and he's writing this letter to Corinth. He had already written 1st and 2nd Thessalonians from Corinth on, this, on the second missionary journey. And so now he's in his third journey and he's writing to the Corinthians. During these trips, there are some scriptural references that tell us that as he was traveling, he was collecting an offering from some of the churches he visited to take them to the impoverished Christians in Jerusalem. That's what I want you to see. That's why I've gone through all of this. See the whole picture, because as he was traveling, he still got those impoverished Christians in Jerusalem on his heart. Uh, being a Jew, that's understandable, but now he's a Christian. He's not worried about whether they're Christian, um, Jewish Christians or Gentile Christians. He knows they're Christians and he knows they're in trouble. And so um, he visited these churches. And as he's been going around to a number of these churches on these missionary journeys, he's been asking for an offering to take to the Christians, the impoverished Christians in Jerusalem. This project was important to Paul. It was on his heart. And you can kind of 
think about it and read into it what his heart and mind must have been about all this. But what he's doing here, understand, he's asking non-Jewish Christians, non-Jewish churches in Greece. And as he's traveling, he's ministering to the Gentiles. He's asking those people to make contributions to the Jewish churches. Well, you know, it's kind of like racial unrest with us today. They didn't really know about that. So they had to be taught a lot. They had to yield their hearts to Christ so that he could continue to work. And so indeed they were giving offerings for churches to help Christian Jews in Jerusalem. So put that all together here and see that the Corinthians in their letter to Paul had apparently asked him about that collection. What about this offering that you're taking up for the Jews in Jerusalem? So he begins this paragraph with now concerning the collection for the saints. That's where we are when we get here. That's the, uh, that's the perspective, that's the context. So what he does here is that he actually gives us some basic principles and guidelines for giving. So let's look at this and see what we can learn from these verses. Look what he says, let's read verse one. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I direct to the churches of Galatia, so you do also, so do you also. On the first day of every week, let each one of you put aside and save as he may prosper, that no collections be made when I come. So what do we know so far? Verse three, and when I arrive, whomever you may approve, I shall send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. So what do we learn here? Let's just unpack it for a little bit. On the first day of every week, on the first day of every week, let each one of you put aside and save. Now, this is interesting because this tells us that the early church met on Sunday, not on Saturday. The Sabbath was set aside for Sunday in favor of the resurrection day. That's what they did. It became known as the Lord's Day. So now we still call Sunday the Lord's Day. And so uh, they met on Sunday. That we learn here that it's worship included the regular giving of money. Every day, every Sunday when you meet, you're going to give. Giving is a part of worship and it's a part of fellowship. Think about that for a minute, because several times in the New Testament, Paul refers to the collection as the koinonia. I learned that preparing this lesson. I didn't know that before, but he refers to the collection as the koinonia. What is koinonia? It's the Greek word for fellowship. And he uses that word for collection. So when we take a collection, when we take an offering, we are fellowshipping together in that giving. And so to him, taking a collection and having fellowship were inseparable. He used the word synonymously. And so sharing money and sharing fellowship went together. It was their life. It was the life of the early church. Now, Paul mentions here giving every week. Now, hear me say this. He is not prescribing a legalistic requirement. He's issuing principles. Remember, he's talking directly to the Corinthians, helping them understand what they need to do as a church and correcting their chaos and correcting their doctrine. And so he's not prescribing, this is not a law here. He, this is not a legalistic requirement. But what he's saying is our giving should be regular, willing, grateful, and committed. It is, a, it is a regular, willing, grateful commitment of our possessions to the Lord. It's regular. It's habitual. And so he's describing here for us a picture where 
you know, I'm going to make it a discipline that I'm going to give to the Lord on a regular basis. That's going to be on my mind. I'm not going to think, just go months without giving anything. And then all of, one, all of a sudden one day think, oh, well, I feel led to give today and then give. So he's laying out this regular spiritual responsibility. He's not saying that it's imperative to give every week. If many of you are like me, I tend to give every month because that's the way my income happens. And so for some of us, it's going to be every month. For some, it may be every two weeks. Some of you may choose to give once a quarter. But, but here's the picture of regular giving. And so we first of all see that it was on the first day of every week. They did it on Sunday. Then he says, who? Let each one of you. First day of every week, each one of you. No Christian is excused. We are stewards of whatever the Lord has given us, even if it seems small it is a recognition that everything I have belongs to the Lord and I am a steward. So Jesus, Mark chapter 12, verse 41, you know the story of the widow. Jesus did not discourage the widow in Mark chapter 12 from putting in her two small copper coins, which amounted to less than what we would know as one cent. He reacted by using her generosity as a model. So these people were giving out of love. They just wanted to give. They wanted to give to God. They wanted to give for God, and they wanted it for His servants. Generosity is inevitable in the heart of a believer. Why? Because the love of God comes alive in us, in our spirits, when we become Christians. And that love of God, that character of God in us, is going to make us want to give, want to help. Um, the next thing we learn is that they were giving at church. They were giving to the church. They were giving through the church. Um, the Christians would store their offerings in the church. It's a picture of a storehouse, and it represents a storehouse. So the church was a place for safekeeping and dispensing of offerings. Now, whether we put money in the offering plate every Sunday or not, weekly worship should remind us of our continual stewardship of the possessions that the Lord has given to us. And then there's sometimes, you know, when we may not, when we may want to give money that's not church. And uh, again, this could be a whole nother lesson, but there are times when maybe some churches are not as responsible is maybe they should be with what they do with your money. Knowing that it is the Lord's money, it is our job as individuals to hold that before the Lord and get instruction from Him and say, what is it that you want me to do with this money? So um, what does He say? Um, on the first day of every week, each one of you, as he may prosper. As he may prosper. Now. I discovered as I was studying this that this is probably um, a subject that we could tackle in a study for several weeks. Um, there is much difference of opinion among Christians as to how much income should be given to the Lord's work. How do we designate it? There are some people who want to say, well, I'm going to tithe my gross income. There are other people who are going to say, I'm going to tithe my net income. But the common traditional answer is 10%. We kind of know that. We kind of know some of that from the Old Testament. We kind of grew up with that. But there's a whole lot of that, again, that we just know on the skim of the surface, just right off the surface, and don't understand a lot of the New Old Testament principles and what the tithe really meant. And so we just assume that we know a lot of things that really are not biblical. They're not in Scripture. And so that could be another whole thing. We know that uh, Abraham gave a tithe of his possessions to Melchizedek, who was a priest of God Most High. We know that Jacob promised to give a tenth of all he had if God would protect and prosper him. But both of those offerings were voluntary. They were not required by God. 
Um, there's a lot to read about and study, uh, and I need to do that. I need to study and learn more because some of those assignments in the Old Testament were actually taxes. They were temple taxes. They were not offerings to God as we usually think about it. And so there's a whole lot to look at, and we could do a, a whole long study on this. And I'd like to maybe do that sometime and let you decide what the Lord is saying to you. But for now, let me just give you just a few things to think about. Some things that I've seen maybe in myself uh, and, and through the years in the church, through giving of offerings, um, some, there's some mindsets there that have been convicting to me. And I just want you to think about them. I don't want to tell you how to think about them. I just want you to think. First one is some believe that tithing purchases God's blessing. And they can take some scriptures and they believe that, that they can buy God's blessing with a tithe. Let me ask you a question. Is God's blessing for sale? Is God's blessing for sale? Then there are those that have rigid rules about tithing and those have become ingrained in our culture. Uh, there are so many things that we have learned, inherited, I guess, absorbed, from our culture that we assume come from the Bible. But they don't. They come from our culture. And so what about these rigid rules about tithing that have become ingrained in our culture while they're really not biblically sound? And then, do massive church budgets sometimes require congregations to be held hostage, hostage to an obligatory tithe, an obligatory tithe. Do we get to a place sometimes when our churches have such massive budgets and our churches have such um, strapping debt that we feel um, obligated? We feel like we have to pay the tithe. And do some congregations make tithing a legalistic practice? Remember, we left legalism when we stepped into grace. What about Malachi 3, verses 8 through 11? Let me just read it right quick so we'll all be on the same page here if I can find it quickly. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it may not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. So if I pay a tithe, my tomato patch, patch is going to do well, right? So we've got to be careful how we just kind of suck up just the surface of some of this teaching. So the question being, does my tithe buy me access to God and protection from Satan. So there's a whole lot we could study about that, and God's very clear when you go through the whole counsel of God. But here's what we know. The way we handle our money is a good indicator of our Christian stewardship of life. We're to be stewards not just of our money, but of our time our abilities, our talents, our minds. And so usually you can tell by, way, by the way a person handles money how he handles his life, what the priorities are in his life. Scripture tells us that. It says that the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, I believe is the literal translation. So if I have a passion for money, and that passion outweighs other passions of my heart, then I'm headed toward all kinds of evil. It's going to mess me up in a lot of ways. 
Um, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17 says, We are not to put our confidence in money. To trust in money is idolatry. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 says, You cannot serve the true God and money at the same time. We're not to regard money as our own. It is God's, and we are stewards. Everything that I have is God's. Blood covenant. Remember, I'm in covenant with him. And when I entered into covenant with him, I turned over all of my resources to him. He turned all of his over to me. So I go before him with my resources, and I know that they belong to God. I'm just a steward. I'm looking at, after it for him until he comes. Um, we're not to overcharge desperate people. Jesus wouldn't do that. So scripture just goes on and on and on and on and on with information about money. And it's confusing today sometimes to see all of the marketing techniques and the giving gimmicks um, while Christian churches and organizations are vying for our dollars. A whole lot of American marketing strategy in a lot of places has entered the church. So we need to think about money. We need to think about money. But here's the deal. The tithe is never mentioned in the New Testament. The tithe is never mentioned in the New Testament. And so it is certainly fine to give a tithe. There's not anything wrong with that. But here's something to think about. Am I giving it to fulfill an obligation? Am I giving it to buy God's favor? Am I giving it because I think that it will cause God to bless me more or to protect me more from the enemy? Am I doing it for those reasons or am I giving it as a response to a loving, willing heart? What's my motive? What is my reason? What is in my heart when I give that? Another question is, can I give more than a tithe? What is the Lord asking me to give? What is he telling me to put into his economy that he has entrusted to me? Giving is never to be by coercion. It's got to come from a heart. When people believe that what you are doing exalts God, then most often they're going to give you more than you need it. Uh, willing hearts open up. And so what is the general New Testament picture of giving? Let me just show you some things. Just, just New Testament. And remember that the New Testament fulfills the old. It doesn't contradict the old. But what is this general New Testament picture of giving? Well, <clears throat> the first one I jotted down was Luke chapter 8. I'm sorry, chapter 6 and verse 38 where he, Jesus says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. They will pour into your lap. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Simple statement, invest with God. You're going to get a good return on your investment when you invest in Him, when you invest according to to his instruction, to what he's saying to your heart. Then there's Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. I'm just going to take the time to read some of these and let the Word of God speak for itself to you. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. <clears throat> Jesus is speaking again. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? 
No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. And then he sums it up. You cannot serve God and mammon or riches. You cannot serve them both at the same time. So what he says is, be sure that your priority is investing with God. Wherever you put your treasure, that's where you're going to put your heart. Your treasure and your heart are closely aligned. So you can tell a lot about your heart by what you're doing with your treasure. Then 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Let each one do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. So what's he saying? If you give freely under God's rules, under God's prompting, under God's instruction, then he's going to supply your needs. God will return your investment with interest. So our mindset needs to be giving it to Him, laying it before Him. Let it be a fellowship offering, fellowship with God and fellowship with other believers. Then Mark, Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 and verse 41. And He, Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the multitude were putting money into the treasury and how many rich people were putting in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. Actually, it's probably less than a cent. And calling his disciples to him, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. For they all put in out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she owned, all she had to live on. The least money was the greatest gift. Why? Because of her heart. Because of her heart. Her heart to give. She wanted the Lord to have it. It was more important to her for Him to have it than it was for her to live. Luke chapter 19. Beginning in verse 1. And Jesus entered and was passing through Jericho. And behold, there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he was trying to see who Jesus was, and he was unable because of the crowd, because he was small in stature. He was a short guy. And he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see Jesus, for Jesus was about to pass through that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry up, come on down, for today I'm going to stay at your house. And Zacchaeus hurried and came down and received Jesus gladly. And when they saw it, they all, the crowd saw it, they all began to grumble saying, he's gone to be the guest of a man that's a sinner. He's a daggum tax collector and Jesus is going to his house. And Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone every anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. He had the faith of Abraham. He believed 
Jesus. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so here we see even Zacchaeus just giving spontaneously out of love and gratitude. He's not giving out of law. He's like, Jesus, what do you want me to do? I'm going to give to the poor. Um, I'll give four, pa- four times as much back to the people that I've defrauded. What's he doing? He's trying to get his life right with the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 is where we are. And in the first two verses, what we see here, first of all, is have a plan. Have a plan. Have a place to keep money available to meet needs. Position yourself to have some money that you can reach into. If you want to do it through the church, you may want to do both. You may want to do it through the church and through maybe a special account that you keep that you keep aside, knowing that, that it is God's money. But we're going to keep some money available to meet needs of other believers. Now, we're going to meet all kinds of needs, but clearly in the New Testament, there's a priority to meet the needs of believers. And so I think the question is, what what does your heart tell you that you need to give? Get before the Lord and say, Lord, I know everything I have belongs to you. You gave it to me. You know, what, what is it that you want me to give? Where do you want me to give it? Where do you want me to place it? Then in chapter 16, let's look at verses 3 and 4. Paul then says uh, in the end of chapter 2, I don't want you to have to take up any collections when I come. Go ahead and get it together. Be saving it so that when I come, it will already be there and be ready. I don't know that I understand why he said that. He just said, get it ready. Maybe they wouldn't be distracted by it. Maybe they wouldn't have to talk about it. It'd just be ready and he could grab it up, get ready to go with it to Jerusalem. But then he says, and when I arrive, whomever you approve, I shall send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. So what have we learned here? Have a plan. Have a place to keep money available to meet needs, maybe through your local church. Be sure that your local church has its needs met. I probably should have said that earlier, but that is, that is priority that the community sees that the members of a local church are taking care of its needs. And then here, verses 3 and 4, those who give to the Lord's work have a right to expect that their gifts are being used legitimately and wisely. Now, remember, we said earlier that when our offerings, when what we're doing exalts God, people are going to have a heart to give. It's just going to be there. One of the surest signs of a saved person is his heart to give. He wants to. He wants to take care of the church. He wants to take care of God's people. He has a heart for the poor. He has a heart for the lost who are hungry as well. Sometimes the best way to to an unsaved person's heart is to meet his physical needs. What does he see is his greatest need? And if that need is physical, sometimes that needs to be met before the spiritual need can be addressed. When I was in college, I had a friend, a sweet mate, <clears throat> who applied to be a summer missionary. And it was a big anticipation thing where these gals would apply to be a missionary and then they'd wait to see where they were going to be sent for the summer. And I remember that Carolyn came back one day with a stunned look on her face. I went to Tift College. It was a women's college sponsored by the Baptist denomination in Forsyth, Georgia. I'm from Georgia. And so we were there. And so Carolyn came back in one day and she said, I'm being sent as a summer missionary. So we were like, wow, wow, tell us where, tell us where. Columbus, Georgia. And Carolyn was stunned by that. And I guess we all gave pause to it because we thought, hmm, At the end of the summer, when we started school back the next fall, we were with Carolyn and said, Carolyn, what did you learn? And she said, I learned 
that you can't tell a child about Jesus until you wash his face and give him something to eat. Sometimes that's the pathway to a heart. People are not going to know and understand Jesus until their felt needs are addressed. Even though we know their greatest need is the need for a Savior, they don't know that. And so sometimes that love and that outreach will pave the way to reach a heart. I read a quote that I want to share with you that spoke deeply to my heart and is relatively t relative to this lesson by an Athenian statesman named Aristides. And he wrote the following statement about Christians living in the second century. Listen to it. Early church. This is the way he described believers. They walk in humility and kindness, and falsehood is not found among them, and they love one another. They despise not the widow, and they grieve not the orphan. He that hath distributeth liberally to him that hath not. If they see a stranger, they bring him under their roof, and they rejoice over him as if he were their brother. For they call themselves brethren, not after the flesh, but after the spirit and in God. But when one of their poor passes away from the world and any of them see him, then he provides for his burial according to his ability. And if they hear that any of their member is any of their number is in prison or oppressed for the name of their Messiah, all of them provide for his needs. And if it is possible that he may be delivered, they deliver him. And if there is among them a man that is poor and needy, and they have not an abundance of necessity, they will fast two or three days that they may supply the needy with his necessary food. I pray that that will be said of us. I pray that that would be said of me. I pray that as the world watches us as the body of Christ, that those are the things they will see. Those are the things that will speak to their hearts. Those are the things that will stand out. And in being that light and salt, then they're going to be drawn to Christ. Because that life is different from anything else in the world. This is the life that Jesus gives. This is the life that separates us from the way the world behaves. If we weren't in Christ, we'd be acting like the world. What makes the difference? The presence of the Holy Spirit in us. But oh, that we would be marked as those who walk in humility and kindness and falsehood is not found among them and they love one another. Well, Acts chapter 24, verse 17, there's scriptural record that Paul got the collection in Corinth and arrived in Jerusalem and presented it to the persecuted saints. Let's be on the lookout for where God would use us. Let's pray. Lord, open our eyes and our hearts to see those around us the way you see them. Let us take the resources that you've given to us, regardless of whether they're great or small, is deemed by the world, it doesn't matter. You have promised to give us enough. But we also know that it is in giving that we receive, but don't let us give with that motive. Let us give out of love for you and love for our fellow man, whether we're gonna receive anything back or not. So search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and let me live a life that demonstrates life everlasting. I pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.